The Middle East War of June of 1967 caused major changes to the maps, the people, and the governments in the Middle East. The early morning of June 5th exploded the surprise attack of the Israeli Air Force on the Egyptian airplanes on the ground. 80% of the Egyptian Air Force was destroyed. By June 7th, Israel had destroyed the air forces of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. They had control of the Sinai Peninsula, Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza. On June 8th, the USS Liberty, America's most sophisticated intelligence ship in 1967, was attacked by Israeli air and naval forces in international waters, 13 miles off of El Arish in Sinai. 34 Americans were killed. 172 were wounded. The Israeli and American governments pronounced the attack as a case of mistaken identity. Issy Rehar was the chief of Israeli naval operations. He reported a ship had shelled the port city of El Arish. So I think around 12 o'clock, I decided to order three uh, MTBs, motor torpedo boats, from the port of Ashdod. Are you sure you can't see any kind of an identification? And all the words came back, no. If you will be sure that it is a military ship, you can hit it. The first Mirage pilot radioed, oil is spilling out into the water. Another added, great, wonderful, she's burning, she's burning. An El Arish commander reported, he's hit her a lot, there's an oil slick in the water. Then headquarters asked, Menachem, is he screwing her? The next wave was super mysteries with thousand pound bombs and canisters of jellied gasoline. Someone in southern command called, he's going down low with napalm all the time. The flight leader noted, it would be a blessing if we could have iron bombs. Otherwise, our Navy's going to get here and do the sinking. A pilot interrupted. Pay attention. The ship's markings are Charlie Tango Romeo 5. There's no flag on her. And headquarters ordered, leave her. The time now is 14.12, and he says, I see CTR 5. And the minute we hear that, the Air Force stops all operations and says, all our aircraft, all our attack aircraft, please stop. I must say that at that point in time, in my mind, it was an American ship. But that opinion was not shared by the commander of the torpedo boat squadron. He believed it to be a small Egyptian freighter, the El Qasir. We told him uh, there are some doubts about identification. These doubts incredibly did not reach the commanding officer who ordered the torpedoes launched. That the order did not reach the commanding officer on the bridge where you launched the torpedoes. At about the range of uh, 1,000 yards, or a little bit more than 1,000 yards, I ordered to prepare the torpedoes and uh, ordered that uh, uh, all commanders will take the uh, action of uh, firing torpedoes. This is the story of the attack on the Liberty told by Israeli and U.S. government sources. Now, we are going to show you what really happened. The survivors of the 294-man crew of the USS Liberty will tell you their story. I'm Tito Howard, the producer of The Loss of Liberty. The host for this program about the attack on the USS Liberty will be Dr. Richard Kiefer, one of the many heroes that day. Dr. Kiefer was the only doctor aboard Liberty. He had a gunshot wound, he had a burn, he had a broken right kneecap, and he had 11 pieces of shrapnel in his abdomen, which he kept together with a life jacket. That man stood on those legs for 28 consecutive hours saving American lives and limbs. This film should shock decent Americans. Above all, men and women who've served in America's armed forces, it will shock particularly as it was an attack not by terrorists implacably opposed to the United States, as is the case of the USS Cole. The Liberty is the most decorated ship in the history of the United States Navy. 840 medals, including the Medal of Honor for her skipper, the Presidential Unit Citation for her crew, two Navy Crosses, 
11 silver stars, and 204 purple hearts. The, the day before, I, I was topside when I when Israeli planes came by, and very close where we could we could wave to the pilots, and they were that close where we could wave back. It was a very clear day. It was a warm day. Sunshine was, was shining brightly out. Uh, nice breeze blowing, and I distinctly remember hearing the flag flapping in the wind. There was approximately 13 sorties of our ship from 6 o'clock till 12 o'clock in the afternoon. We had a general quarters drill that lasted uh, 45 minutes or so. Our captain, uh, like me being an engineer, really believed in watertight integrity and making sure our people were equipped and knew how to fight fires and repair damage. I was coming to go back to the Trescom area. I stepped out on deck. That plane came by and looked right in the cockpit. You waved, I waved. That's how close they were, and they knew who they were. Well, all the recon flights uh, that they had that morning, looking at our ship for approximately six to seven hours, they had a good idea of what they were doing, and uh, they hit, they hit us hard and fast with everything they had. Commander William McGonagall, the ship's captain. Although he had been badly wounded, most of his bridge crew had been killed. He stayed on the bridge throughout the attack and the long night that followed. Admired and respected by his crew, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor for gallantry. When the plane struck, it was without provocation and certainly unexpected. And they seemed to descend on us from all directions at the same time. Those rockets and machine guns tore the ship. It killed men on deck. And we were defenseless. I heard this big bang and there was bullet holes all behind in the cushions of the couch that I just left. And by the time I got to the door of the ward room, the skipper was on the PA system that we were under attack by unknown forces, manual battle stations. Then the regular general quarter sound alarm went off, and right across the hatch from the ward room is where I would go through, down through decks to my station. When I went through there, there was one rocket that came through and helped me to get down two floors in a dad burn hurry. When I got up off my knees down there, well, we were well under attack. And uh, the skipper again was on the uh, phone system telling uh, auxiliary radio to get word out to anyone that they could that we were under attack by unknown forces and we were in the need of help. My reporter station uh, was Radio Central. It was my responsibility to keep up you know, ship to ship or ship to shore communications. And uh, out on deck in Radio Central, we were taking rounds through the bulkheads. There was a two 55-gallon drums of gasoline just outside the bulkhead on the O1 level that had caught fire from the strafing run. And that was uh, heating that outside bulkhead and peeling the paint off on the inside. There was a lot of smoke in the compartment. There's holes where we were taking rounds where the sunlight shining through, and it was a real surrealistic look. I was topside fighting fires and doing other damage control work throughout the duration of the attack. At the same time, I was able to observe the jets flying overhead, and I also observed the American flag flying from the mast. At no time did that flag hang limp from the mast. I was one of the two signalmen on uh, the USS Liberty uh, when the ship was attacked, and uh, my only job uh, during the attack was to make sure that, uh, that the flag was flying, so uh, every few minutes I would walk out at the signal bridge up at the mast and fighting what fire we could but what little water I could give the people topside for the fire, uh, it was really a problem. So that on the first pass they knocked out our, in our ability to call for help. The one remaining antenna, which I had shut down because it had some problems in the tuner, is probably why it didn't get hit. I had to jury rig a you know, coaxial cable directly from the transmitter to the antenna. So we were working feverishly to try to get a signal out uh, at that time, and then finally there was uh, it, we were able to get a signal to the Sixth Fleet, and then they, I was listening to or monitoring that uh, communications, and they said that they would be sending aircraft, and so 
at that point, we just felt overjoyed that knowing that there was going to be aircraft coming to our rescue. The initial strike by the planes on the ship commenced at about five minutes after two in the afternoon of 8 June. And the attack lasted about 20 minutes. The ship was fired at from port to starboard, starboard to port, stem to stern, and there was not a single compartment above the waterline that did not have one or more direct penetration by a rocket, machine gun, and they also dropped napalm on the bridge of the ship. At 2.35 p.m., Defense Secretary Robert McNamara recalled the 12 Navy fighters that had been sent to our defense by the carrier Saratoga. At that time, no one aboard the Liberty had identified the attacking Israelis. It was one and one half hours later that our embassy in Israel first told Washington that Israelis had attacked a ship, possibly a U.S. Navy ship. How then did McNamara know to recall the help sent to defend the Liberty? When the ship came under attack, um, now here this general quarters, this is no drill, the ship is under attack by an identified aircraft. And there were ping-pings, we heard a lot of pinging, uh, which were bullets running across the deck, and then we heard explosions. We didn't know what was going on, but of course General Quarters had sounded, so we battened down the hatches and uh, we started doing what we were trained to do. We were under attack, we could hear these shells hitting the ship. The whole ship would ring, it was like you were on the inside of a huge bell and someone beating on it with a sledgehammer. The aircraft take pictures as they fire their guns. These are used for analysis of their tactics and these are used for confirmation of the damage that they've done. These pictures have never been publicly presented. Lieutenant Ennis was sitting on the deck and it was blood coming out of his mouth and his knee was, was damp, uh, he had an injury in his knee and it was blood coming out of it. Lieutenant Toth had got blown off, I think the old four level, but I come across him and he was just peppered from head to toe with shrapnel. And I covered him up with a blanket. My brother, he was sent to, um, on the bridge of the ship to find out what was, uh, who the planes were, where they came from. They had no markings. That's against the Geneva Rules of War right there. Uh, he received a silver star for his efforts, so um, he was cut down by the planes. The captain, initially after the attack, sustaining a shrapnel wounds in his knee, and somebody put a, a tourniquet around his leg, and I got coffee. I think about five cups of coffee went down the captain to keep him going. It was impressive because with all the blood loss and everything, he was, he was going all night long. A short time after the air attack had been completed, the three torpedo boats approached us from our starboard quarter at high speed and in an apparent torpedo launch attitude. The three Israeli torpedo boats fired six torpedoes at the Liberty. Because of Captain McGonagall's handling of the ship, five missed. Intelligence base was destroyed. Twenty-five American sailors died almost instantly. This hole in the side was uh, in excess of 40 feet in diameter. You could put your whole house in that hole. And we were right in the middle of it. We couldn't believe what we saw. You couldn't walk around that part of the deck without stepping on a piece of someone. In fact, Phil Turney and myself had found a shoe with a foot still in it. I do remember the, the alarm for standby to abandon ship. Don't believe your station yet. They were getting preparing to and then that was called off because apparently the life rafts had been shot up. So there were, if you went in the water, you were on your own. And the list on the ship was considerable. You could tell it, it looked like at first we were going to maybe roll over. The lights went out and the ship rolled over and I figured, well, it's the end. The torpedo had hit the side of the ship of the room I just stepped out of, killed every man in my division that was in there. Um, this fellow first class that I mentioned, he was on the phone at the time, just outside the door. It took off the back of his head. Um, it broke 
My lower left leg, both bones, collapsed my lung, broke ribs, fractured my skull, blew out my eardrums. We took the guy down, down below, and I don't know how many runs I made up and down, you know, carrying wounded. And I saw all the bodies laying there on the tables at where Dr. Kiefer had been working on. And I was told that he was in the officer's wardroom operating on more people. 34 were killed, another 172 were wounded. The care of these people was done by myself with the assistance of two corpsmen. The corpsmen did many things of minor surgery and I just had so much to do keeping people together, keeping their limbs attached to their body. We were in international waters. It was a beautiful day. You couldn't mistake us, and our, and our flag was flying for crying out loud. They were gonna, there to kill us, and it just didn't, didn't register. That here they were, Israeli uh, people, and they were going to try to kill us. It was just a very, very appalling situation. A strange quiet descended on the Liberty crew. After the explosion, the pounding of machine gun bullets slowed and stopped. Fires were put out. The stunned, angry, and exhausted crew caught their collective breath. Limping at five knots toward sanctuary several hundred miles to the north, they had somehow survived one of the most ferocious sustained attacks ever on an American ship. 34 were dead, 171 were wounded. All survivors had mental scars. There is not one single life raft. The wounded are treated. Sailors remember that they were promised help. They expected that help. That help in the form of phantom jets from the USS Saratoga was on its way. It never arrived. It would be the next morning, 17 hours after the attack began, before they would see an American face. Finally, the USS Davis, and later the USS Massey, came alongside the Liberty. Many of their sailors wept as they boarded the Liberty, saw open decks stained with American blood, and parts of American bodies on the deck. Helicopters from the USS America arrived several hours later to medevac the most seriously wounded Liberty sailors back to that carrier. The air attack by two squadrons of Israeli aircraft, French-built Mirage 3s and Super Mystères, 821 rocket and cannon holes were found in the Liberty. Canisters of napalm had torched the ship. After the ferocious air attack, Liberty was pounded by three Israeli torpedo boats. One of their six torpedoes struck the Liberty, left the gaping hole at the water line. There were thousands of holes from armor-piercing machine gun bullets. They sank life rafts, shot at firefighters and stretcher bearers at the bridge and into the engine room. Dr. Kiefer and his pharmacist mate performed in heroic fashion, as did all of the crew. About the same time, Israeli land and air forces attacked the Golan Heights. In a well-planned and executed strike, the attack, the recall, the jamming, the pounding, the torpedoes, somehow the Liberty survived. And almost immediately, the second part of the outrage, the cover-up by the Israeli and the American government began. I had to go to work at midnight, and I'm trying to sleep, you know, just thinking about how we had been so shafted by our government, the Israeli government, told to shut up, no chance to talk to one another. And it just, it angered me. It really, really angered me. On the day of the attack, I tried to coordinate communications. The Israelis had taken out all of our transmitting antennas. My RMs, not knowing any better during the strafing runs, were stringing long wires so that we could get an SOS out. 
And thanks to them, the ones that survived, we did get an SOS out to the USS America. Without George Golden, the ship would have sunk. Had it sunk, I assume when debris washed ashore the next day, it would have blamed, been blamed on Egypt. There were many, many miracles that day. I shouldn't be here. After watertight integrity had been established and the hatch had been sailed, they reopened it as I floated by. Uh, Buddha Schnell, Bud Schnell, went down and pulled me out. I'm just supposed to be here. None of us should be alive today. Much to my dismay, I personally witnessed the machine gunning of life rafts as they floated by the Israeli torpedo boat crew members raked the life rafts thoroughly with machine gun fire, making sure that if there had been anyone in the life rafts, they would have not, they would not have survived. After the Israeli torpedo blew a huge hole in the Liberty, the last three life rafts were put over the side. Israeli torpedo boats sank two of those rafts took the third aboard. We were left with no rafts, nothing that could float. Shooting life rafts on a ship in distress is a war crime. Worst of all is what our government is doing to cover all this whole thing up. Uh, when I heard that um, Johnson, in the heat of the battle, was uh, telling the Admiral Geis of the uh, Sixth Fleet that he didn't give a damn if every man drowned and the ship sinks. He said, I don't give a damn if every man drowns in the ship sinks. I don't want to embarrass our allies. That made me sort of wonder, with unmarked planes, how did he know it was our allies? So we should have had planes on site 45 minutes into this two-hour attack, and they never showed. So did Israel apologize and then continue to attack us for an hour and 15 more minutes, or were we being lied to as to the conditions of why they've recalled the planes? And because of it top secret operation of liberty and it being uh, the sensitivity of it being Israel our closest ally who accidentally attacked the ship that we are ordered uh, not to grant any interviews you know don't discuss this among yourselves referring to the attack uh, don't get over on the beach drinking in the bars and running your mouth and he says in fact if you go ashore in Malta you will remove your ship's name from your jersey or go ashore in civilian clothes. Well, another light goes off in my mind. Here's a flag admiral in the middle of the gung-ho 6th Fleet telling enlisted men to go ashore in civilian clothes that we're not even authorized to possess. And he says, you know, so that we won't be singled out and uh, be asked questions about it. And he says, don't discuss the attack among yourselves. Don't write your friends back home about it. He says, in fact, when you get back home, don't even discuss it with your wife and family. And he said quite sternly, just forget it ever happened. And he says that uh, repercussions for violating these orders to silence could result in your court-martial imprisonment for violating national security or worse. I noticed a very large helicopter uh, with Israeli markings hovering very close to us. Uh, I looked in the, uh, the door of the helicopter, which was open, and I could see uh, a number of Israelis carrying automatic weapons. They had just heard that the uh, uh, Sixth Fleet had finally launched aircraft to come to our assistance, and so they just, uh, they just left the scene. Helicopter gunships, I'm sure in my mind, would have picked off survivors if we'd abandoned ship. They were sent there to finish us off. The aircraft were sent to make us incommunicado so we couldn't send an SOS out. The torpedo boats were sent to sink us, and the helicopters were sent to pick off survivors so there'd be no choice. It was a perfectly executed military operation. If you look at the photographs of the Liberty after the attack, on the first strafing run, they used heat-seeking missiles that took out the tuning section of every transmitting antenna on the ship. In less than two seconds, they had taken out all our communication capability. The attack on the USS Liberty lasted as long as the attack on Pearl Harbor, about two hours. 
You've heard the outrageous, implausible Israeli version of the attack on liberty, told by their first-hand observers. You've heard what actually happened, told by the valiant Liberty crew. Now, hear what some of America's greatest heroes and leaders have to say. Colonel Mitchell Page was the last Marine standing after repulsing a Japanese regiment on Guadalcanal. We all know that this was in international waters. It was an unprovoked, intentional attack on a U.S. vessel with one objective, to sink it and kill all aboard. Unprovoked attack. I think it was dastardly. I think it was a betrayal of any friendship that we may have had with that nation. And I think that it should be exposed to the entire world and all brought out so that the whole world would know the actual truth about that that particular day in 1967. And very widely you could see this was an American ship. And not only did the Israelis attack it, they did this with their Army, Navy, and Air Force. Though badly wounded, Navy Master Chief Bob Bush held off a Japanese advance while saving his commanding officer's life. You know, it's, it's impossible for me to figure out why maybe I would sit here and attack you when we're friends. I mean, we're, they're, get, they're getting our money to buy those French airplanes. And then they turn around and attack our ship when they can see that it's our ship. It's absolutely uncalled for. Army Colonel Lou Millet led the last bayonet charge against vastly superior Chinese forces in Korea. I was in the World War II. I studied all the different types of aircraft so that when I shot at a plane, I made sure I shouldn't hit the enemy and not out. They know what those ships look like. And if they don't, I can't conceive that they don't know. I do know this. It was a criminal act. It was an act of war. It's as bad as Vietnam, allowing people to, who are trying to save people from tyranny to die for nothing. Admiral Thomas Moore is the longest serving active four-star admiral in American history. He is the only American admiral to have commanded both the Atlantic and Pacific fleets. He was head of NATO forces, served as chief of naval operations, and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for two terms. The Navy's chief fighter, the F-14 Tomcat, was named after Admiral Tom Moore. The question is, uh, if the uh... Israelis uh, thought the, the frequencies they jammed were, in fact, uh, broadcast by the Egyptian ship. Uh, why did they uh, uh, jam the American frequencies? There's no question about the fact that the jamming of the Liberty frequencies was deliberate and uh, uh, was undoubtedly ordered by high authority. Since uh, a large uh, part of the caches were uh, caused by torpedo boats, could have been uh, uh, prevented from uh, making those attacks uh, by the aircraft that were on their way to help when they were recalled. Admiral Arlie Burke was known as Mr. Navy. His long and illustrious career was capped by him becoming the Chief of Naval Operations. The high-tech, modern American Navy destroyers were named the Arleigh E. Burke class of destroyer. And don't know yet why we didn't protect that ship. I don't know why the Israelis would take such terrific chances. It must have been something that was very important to them to decide to attack without considering the probability of war. Recuperating from serious throat surgery, the Saratoga skipper, Joe Tully, spoke about the launch and recall of protective aircraft. I had launch ready at that time, 12 aircraft, conventionally armed, and I immediately launched them. And to my surprise, the America did not launch. About the same time, uh, a message came from... Um, Rear Admiral Larry Geis, who was the carrier division commander and who was not 
the officer in tactical command, but who was senior to me, who had somehow been given the tactical command or assumed it, ordering the strike aircraft to return to Saratoga. And it was the first time that the hotline, the red line between Washington and Moscow, had been activated. And the message from the United States to Chairman Kosygin at the time was, advise General Nasser that the American planes are going to be launched to determine what the status of the Liberty was. I have spent a large part of my life flying over the oceans and identifying ships. And this ship was perhaps the easiest ship to identify that was uh, listed in the United States Navy. Equipped with antenna from bow to stern, pointing in every direction, it reminds one of a large, vigorous lobster. And a look that made it extremely easy to recognize. And so I will never, never buy the idea that uh, the pilots thought this was uh, some other ship. And it appeared from the ferocity of the attack that the intent of the attackers was to sink the ship. Maybe they hoped to have no survivors so that they would not be held accountable for the attack after it occurred. We didn't know who was attacking us. They didn't know who was attacking us. Well, I don't know how Washington can say, don't go because they're friends of ours. So that's the thing that's always bothered me right there. I never myself accepted the Israeli purported explanation. Um, accidents don't occur through repeated attacks by surface vessels and by aircraft. It obviously was a decision taken pretty high up in, on the Israeli side because it involved combined forces. Um, the ship was flying an American flag. Even if it had been unidentified from a, an, an Israeli point of view, uh, it was a reckless thing for them to do. Suppose it had been a Soviet ship. In fact, it produced very large problems indeed. George Ball, the brilliant and courageous Undersecretary of State at the time of the 67 war, wrote about the attack on the Liberty subsequently. He said, the ultimate lesson of the Liberty attack was that it had far more effect on policy in Israel than in America. Israel's leaders concluded that nothing they might do would offend the Americans to the point of reprisal. If America's leaders did not have the courage to punish Israel for the blatant murder of American citizens, it seemed clear that their American friends would let them get away with almost anything. Fleet Tug Papago would be our escort into Malta. The divers rigged a large canvas over the torpedo hole and it was secured in place using ropes that were passed under the hull and over the main deck. Once the canvas was in place, the Liberty could proceed under its own power towards Malta. Once we were in dry dock in Malta, then came the gruesome task of removing the bodies and the debris from the research uh, I was unfortunate enough to draw the first shift as part of our division, which would be used to cut the debris uh, away from the bodies so they could be removed from the research spaces. The first body to come out was almost unrecognizable. Due to being in salt water for six days, the body was almost completely hairless. We fingerprinted the body, put it in a body bag, uh, and moved it out of the spaces. This continued through the night and on into the next day. After 33 days in Malta and the Liberty was repaired, we brought the ship back to Norfolk. Now it was over. The Liberty was home. Over. It will never be over until the truth is known. The cover-up began with the report of the casualties. The first word that we had out was before the torpedo attack that we had nine dead and 75 wounded. This has been the number that has almost invariably appeared in the newspapers as an attempt to minimize the nature of the attack, the ferocity of the attack, and the unjustifiable nature of the attack. 
There was no uh, press campaign to uh, uh, cover this in its entirety uh, for the benefit of the American people. And as a matter of fact, uh, in many cases, the press uh, uh, supported the Israeli campaign. Future Judge Advocate General of the Navy, Rear Admiral Merlin Starring, was given less than 24 hours to review the 600-page Court of Inquiry report. In the course of my career as a Navy lawyer, I have been called upon to review and take actions upon uh, hundreds of investigations of various uh, degrees of importance and volume. This is the only instance in which a record of such an investigation has been withdrawn from me after I had been asked to review it and had not been given an opportunity to complete my advice to the convening authority. As you know, it's a, a voluminous document. And one of the things that uh, I initially had difficulty with, and still do, is the fact that the very first statement of fact that the court arrived at and presented was this. Available evidence combines to indicate the attack on liberty on 8 June was in fact a case of mistaken identity. Now that is the sort of thing in this record that I found great difficulty in supporting from the evidence that was included. I'm convinced that it was withdrawn from me in this instance because of my statement to Captain Boston that I was having serious problems with the evidence that was available to support the statements of fact. In the subsequent cover-up, the Israelis maintained that they thought the Liberty was the small Egyptian freighter, the al -Qusair. This is not credible. Not only was the Liberty flying a large American flag, but it was five times as large as the al -Qusair, and its profile was unique. It bore no resemblance whatsoever to the Egyptian ship. Tordella was the deputy director at the time of the attack. Tordella, when he received the copy of the, uh, the Israeli uh, mistake explanation, wrote across the top of it a nice whitewash. He didn't believe it at all. And he later wrote another memorandum for the record indicating that uh, he thought that uh, the most likely explanation was that uh, the Israelis attacked the Liberty because uh, they didn't want the Liberty to hear what was going on in the Sinai. Um, and this is the highest professional at NSA. Uh, in addition, the, the uh, director of NSA uh, at the time, Marshall Carter, um, told me that uh, he thought it was deliberate. In addition to that, he was very uh, offended in another memorandum he wrote that um, it appeared that the uh, Johnson administration wanted to cover up the whole thing. They actually wanted to sink the ship so that Israel wouldn't be embarrassed. Admiral Kidd, uh, when he came aboard our ship to interview the survivors, uh, he got us in small groups, three or four or five sailors, and he would ask us questions. The first thing he did is uh, he took off his stars, laid them on the table, and said, listen, open up to me and talk to me just like her. I'm just one of, just like you, one of you. So we did. We trusted him. We opened up with our hearts. We told him exactly the way we felt, what happened, what we saw. And when that was done, he put his stars back on, on his lapel, and he ordered us not to say anything to anybody, our families, friends, shipmates, anyone. If we did, we faced the possibility of a court-martial, penitentiary, or worse, and everyone knew what worse meant. Actually, he scared the death out of me. I didn't talk about the attack to anyone for almost 20 years. Not knowing why they did this and what, and not having our government back us then and now. It's, it's an open sore. It's, uh, it's, it's festering uh, to this day. It's not going away. I think it's important that we do have an investigation. I, w I would never give up on that until I too old to come to these things. It needs to be done. Uh, Pete Buecher from the Pueblo said he wouldn't even have gone if he could have known what really happened to us. All he knew was some piddly little thing he heard about on the news. 
In late 1991, Dwight Porter, who was ambassador to Lebanon during the 1967 war, told columnists Evans and Novak that immediately after the attack on the Liberty, the CIA station chief handed him intercepted messages between the Israeli war room and their planes. The pilots were given orders to attack the ship, and they replied immediately that it was an American ship. The Israeli headquarters responded, you have your orders, attack the ship. The pilots tried once again, but it's an American ship. We can see its flag. And headquarters insisted, you have your orders, attack it. And attack it they did, and the consequences are well known. So one of the things I found out was that uh, that had never been discovered before uh, was the fact that at the time the Liberty was attacked, the NSA also had an eavesdropping plane flying high above the scene of the action. It was an EC-121, and uh, during the entire course of the war, the U.S. Uh, had uh, eavesdropping planes going over the um, area, collecting signals, eavesdropping on what was going on below. And this plane was uh, flying right over the scene of the attack. And I talked to two of the crew members of the plane, and both of them agreed that the, what they heard were comments from both the pilots and the torpedo boat uh, uh, personnel uh, mentioning the U.S. flag. Uh, now that flies in the face of what the Israeli explanation says. The Israeli explanation says nobody on either the planes or the ships ever saw a U.S. flag. Evans and Novak got further confirmation of the Israeli attack from an American-born Israeli major, Seth Mintz, who was in the Israeli war room at the time of the attack. He told the reporters, quote, Everyone felt that it was an American ship and that it was the Liberty. There were comments about the markings, about the flag. Everybody in the room was convinced it was an American ship, unquote. Mintz told Evans and Novak that the Israelis were guilty of an outrage. True. But the American suppression of the truth was an equal outrage. Well, at the time, the Liberty was off the coast of the Sinai, off the coast of uh, um, where El Arish was on the uh, Sinai Peninsula. Um, according to Israeli uh, military historians uh, who, who wrote reports of it at the time, uh, and other eyewitnesses, the um, Israeli military was uh, killing prisoners, Egyptian prisoners, uh, committing war crimes, uh, desperate acts of, uh, of uh, war crimes in order to, uh, so they wouldn't have to transport the prisoners because they had no place to put the prisoners. They decided to take the most expedient, uh, expedient method and, and just kill them. If the planes dispatched by the Saratoga had continued to the rescue, the Israelis would have been driven off. But Washington took the Israelis at their word. They said they had recognized their error, and they apologized. And the attack had already stopped, they said. But they were lying. The attack continued for another hour and 20 minutes, during which 25 more American sailors died, and 110 more were wounded. All would have been spared if the American planes sent to help them had not been recalled by Washington. The point was the attack did take place. There were a lot of reasons that the Israelis would have wanted to hide things from the U.S. And that's why there is a need for investigation. Um, I mean, you're not going to take the, the word of somebody who was uh, the principal person who caused it. Uh, that'd be like uh, taking the word of a defendant in a, uh, in, a, in a shooting. Every one of the thousand odd clashes between Syria and Israel between 1948 and 1967 was examined by the UN Supervisory Commission, which found out that only a very, very few had been caused by the Syrians. A few dozen of the clashes were ambiguous and all of the rest were caused by Israel. Well, there were many officers in many nations, and they all report the same thing. Could they all have been lying? Still, we no longer have to rely only on the UN documentation. Moshe Dayan, who commanded the Israeli forces in 1967, and had given the order to occupy the Golan, gave an interview to an Israeli journalist in 1976. The interview was kept secret until April 19. 
1997, when it was published in an Israeli newspaper. It has been authenticated by Israeli historians, and General Dayan's daughter, Yael, a member of the Knesset, insisted that it be published. Why did he give the order to invade? Essentially, it was because of pressure from the would-be settlers in the Golan, who convinced Levi Eshkol, the Israeli Prime Minister, to occupy the heights and the fertile lands beyond. And when asked if that were all there was to it, Diane replied, I can tell you with absolute confidence that they were not thinking about security. They were thinking about the heights land. I saw them. I spoke with them. They didn't even try to hide their greed for that land. The best one is the one where they wanted to go on heights. And Johnson said, that's enough, that's enough. And they needed another day to get the goal on heights, which they still have, <laughs> which I didn't think you were supposed to do, take land from another country and keep it. If we could get the truth of liberty out, that it would change history, I think, in this country. I cannot. Absolutely. Can't see why our American newspapers and TV people have helped to cover this up, but not covering some of our stories. The Navy Board of Inquiry would not admit testimony about the jamming, the recall, the unmarked planes, the shooting of life rafts, and other material that we tried to present. They asked questions. We were allowed to answer those questions. Period. They put me into a ward with 12 to 13 other patients. And within 30 minutes, they removed me from that ward and put me into a single room. I noticed that I had a name tag with Smith on, and right after I noticed that, an officer came in and told me that from now on, my name is Smith. I was never on the Liberty, and I was never, ever to talk about it to anyone. I still have 53 pieces of shrapnel in me today. Never before has the U.S. Navy ignored eyewitness testimony of American military to accept on faith the story told by their attackers. Certain entries in the ship's log of June 8th have raised serious questions. The, nobody knew who was wounded or how severely. This had not been established until days after reaching Malta. The log also minimized the duration of the attack by over an hour and a half, conveniently fitting the Israeli version. It then documented the number of wounded not as the actual 172, but at the widely published media figure of 75. It should be a congressional committee, both Senate and House, to examine all the data available. And it's, it's getting late to do this because Mike McGonagall, God bless his soul, is gone. I know that Bill was in on board the USS Liberty and the ship was off the coast at Gaza Strip, as I recall, and yet our government printed, put it in writing, in the United States Senate book of Congressional Medal of Honor recipients that he received his medal for action in Vietnam. Now, to me, that is one of the worst cover-ups in American history. How low can our government go? And it's something that I'd like to see totally investigated and a, a a closure of this issue because I think President Johnson was the villain on it. I think he recalled the people that were to defend this ship. I have never accepted the Israeli explanation and so far as I'm concerned the affair of the USS Liberty remains a scar on the relations between Israel and the United States. Things like this don't happen. Things are caused to happen. There must be some reason, some reason why more is not known. There must be some reason why we didn't react more deliberately, more directly, more positively, as we have reacted many times in our history before and since. As a Marine, I'm proud to say that three members of the Liberty crew were Marines. Two of them died that day, but Bryce Lockwood was decorated for saving sailors' lives. And Bill McGonigal, the skipper of the Liberty, was awarded the Medal of Honor for action above and beyond the call of duty. And I firmly believe, after review of the, of the documentation of this film, that an in-depth, honest investigation, inquiry, into what really happened that day is owed to the members of the crew, their family, 
and all Americans. We need to take some very serious efforts to uh, bring out the full story. And on that basis, I would certainly recommend that we pursue this with diligence. We go to the Congress and, uh, and urge them to conduct a, a, a formal, complete uh, investigation to get the full story about our, the loss of our great ship, the Liberty. In the case of the Liberty, this is the first time, to my knowledge, where a United States warship has been attacked without warning and uh, no action whatever was taken to investigate this situation on the part of the Congress. I have urged this over and over again, and I still think that the attack on the Liberty warrants a full-fledged uh, investigation by the Congress of the United States. Those murdered that day must not have died in vain. The plea for justice by the Navy's most decorated crew should forever haunt us. Americans must never forget this second day of infamy and our own unbalanced foreign policy in the Middle East that precipitated it. <laughs>